there is nothing special about the human being. Everything can be reconstructed if we have just enough information to reconstruct it. And this higher being stuff already commenced with all the religions that we have suffered for ages. And we still attribute this kind of a special higher power to our being, which there is not. Henrik, am I glad to hear you once again, my dear co-host. God damn with you. <laughs> I, I I still want to point out that, you know, you are the one who put the film on the calendar. I merely gave you the suggestion. It's the post-truth era, Henrik, I can say. Whatever I want. And it's still going to be accurate. I, I was actually supposed to ask from you that since we... Just recently made the Blade Runner episode and now we are touching the ghost in the shell. Is this all rationality and zero feelings curry finally trying to figure out what is that humanity thing that you are supposed to take part in? I see zero humanity in this going through this manga related episodes which require like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours and, hours and sleepless nights. This is our third time <laughs> reading some manga. And this time I didn't even have time to read the manga, because the goddamn movie itself is so condensed that I didn't have time to go through the actors and the director or whatever. That's all yours, Henrik. So, thank you. See, th that's <laughs> what makes this a high-class podcast. <laughs> but boy, oh boy, I did waste four of my nights in a row for Ghost in the Shell, and I no, really you, you, didn't, you didn't want waste. to... You didn't waste them, you you spent them well. We will find out in this podcast. <laughs> Henrik, okay, all kidding aside, how is my co-host? I'm doing relatively well. I just made it back from the University Theatre Fest trip, which I took this weekend. It was one day completely in total spent in, in a bus, but I did catch up some nice plays. And, well, I did manage to, while on the bus, I did manage to check the film once again for this episode and also took my notes on a completely unforeseen and separate set of papers which have nothing to do with each other. I don't know how you manage, Henrik. You have like five applications and then also these manual retro papers that you can actually write with a pencil. That's that's great. But I also don't understand, even though you have seen this movie before, this was the first time for me to see the film. But you traveling, I don't know, going to concerts, studying, working, going to events, and you still managed to be here tonight. And you're actually going to say something about this film? Uh, I must I, definitely will try. I salute you, or I will salute you after this episode. No, 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 don't do that, don't do that. I mean, if you ask basically anyone in Finland, you know, all, all students are forever lazy bums who just raise social benefits and do nothing at all. <laughs> I, I have a reputation to maintain here. Which is? Which is being an alcoholic lazy bum who just raises benefits and does absolutely nothing. <laughs> Well, I guess that's a uh, one way of having a reputation. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I can't disappoint the Finnish government here and be super productive in any way. Oh, well, no. Yeah. Oh, boy. So, yeah, this is our third film that has something to do with manga. We have had Uzumaki, we have had Akira, now Ghost in the Shell. Oh boy! At, at this point, are, are you actually getting the feeling that there is something definitely wrong with the Japanese people and the Japanese comic industry and manga is something that we should definitely never touch again. Uh, we could just jump onto porn in the next episode again. I think the Japanese have had too much airtime in this podcast. And <laughs> next time it's uh, time to get to something more simple. Well, <laughs> uh, this film, Henrik, is Ghost in the Shell. And my name is Garri and... God, I was 
pretty hot 10 years ago. Look in my old pictures here. I, I, I mean, can we change the subject for this episode? Maybe we don't have to, you know, go through this. Well, well, shit me, I'm going through my notes and, you know, looking at the film here and going to the IMDB and Wikipedia pages and you are looking at past photographs of yourself. <laughs> this, this, dear listeners, this is the workload or how we share the workload here on this podcast. <clears throat> yeah, my ego is just fine. Don't worry. All right, in 2029, well, it seems like it's 10 years from now, Henrik human brain can be augmented partially and fully. Ghost in the consciousness, or the soul if you will, and the body is the shell. Section 9 versus Section 6. Welcome to Ghost in the Shell. This is the plot. Anything to add or should we <laughs> go to scene by scene? Okay, do you have anything on the actors? Uh, unfortunately not that much. Ghost in the Shell, once again, since I'm not that well versed in anime, is a film which I mostly know the director, Mamaru Oshi, or however you pronounce these Japanese names, who is very well known anime director and has done some live action features like Avalon in 2001. And also the writer of the story and the original manga, Masamune Shiro, who is also a very prominent name in the industry. Okay. Yeah. Most well known for, you know, giving the background story which was used as a springboard in the 2017 live action remake of Ghost in the Shell. Ah, okay. Good to know. You know, I tried to get my hands on the live action remake, but, you know, this original took so much of my time that I didn't have time for anything else. And maybe you... that's that's for the better. Yeah, it, it was for, for the better. You really didn't miss that much if you didn't catch up on the live action remake. Well, I did miss Scarlett Johansson. You know, I mean. Who is not nude in the film, even though the trailer teases you extremely a lot with that. <laughs> she, she has some kind of a full body armor to give her, you know, that cybernetic look and hide all the tits in the film. So in that sense, you know, nothing of value was lost if you didn't catch up with the live action. Well, yeah, I always have my lost in translation opening shot, so that'll have to do. Anyway, Henrik, I mean, if I would be more in the women, let's say Scarlett Johansson would be my pick. I mean, there, there is something magical about Scarlett Johansson, let's, let's face it, everybody, right now, <laughs> I, I, right? I don't know if there's... Right? <laughs> the, the last time I remember there was something magical in Scarlett Johansson, it was when she faced extremely lot of backlash after being the Hollywood mm. ambassador for SodaStream. <laughs> okay, what? <laughs> that, that's, that's, uh, that, I would say, is as magical as shit can get. All the things that you have time to do as an actor. Well, regarding the actors, you know, the, there is like a name drop. We have Atsuko Tanaka, Akio Otsuka, Koichi Yamadera, and Yutaka Nakano, and several others. If you know more of those, go ahead, or otherwise we carry on. Well, Atsuko Tanaka is, or, well, basically everyone who plays a major character in the film is someone who, who is a franchise namestay. Atsuko being the person who has voice acted Motoko Kusanaki in basically all the incarnations of Ghost in the Shell. I'm not now going to vouch for the two video games that have been made, but at least in the anime feature films and the standalone complex. And, well, Akio Otsuka, I believe we have tackled him in one of the previous episodes, but once again, in Western audiences, might be most well known as the Japanese voice for Soidu Snake in Metal Gear Solid franchise. Oh, there again, once again. And director, as mentioned, Mamoru Oshii, should we go on? Why not? I mean, otherwise this will be just, you know, name dropping a few actors who have done anime films, which most likely just me and two of our listeners have actually seen and 
are, are you actually devaluating our listeners intelligence or the knowledge of films only two listeners what no, no, about no. the or what about the rest of the 20,000 listeners are you I, no no i'm i'm not doing nothing of the sort instead i'm saying that we only have like two listeners and they actually have a life plus 20,000 okay I, I'm certain that you know those twenty thousand are just your alternate accounts that you have created. <laughs> <clears throat> well, you know, <laughs> I'm the user account manager in my work, so it, it kind of explains why you actually decided to take my suggestion and tackle a film that deals with a self-sufficient AI that can tackle on the internet in nanoseconds and also is a master troll. Yeah, so next time you log on to your Windows system, dear listener, remember that as the time goes on and we reach 2029, there is a chance that your user account will acquire self-consciousness and actually take over your computer, at which point you're fucked. At which point you all of a sudden realize that for some odd reason you have liked the FlickLab Facebook page. <laughs> Okay, so something shortly about gits or or jits or ghost in the shell, simply, or kokaku kidotai, which is actually the Japanese title, as you might guess, and it doesn't mean ghost in the shell. It means in English mobile armored riot police. So there you go. Widely considered the greatest anime film of all time for whatever reason, combines traditional cell animation and CGI. Based on the manga of Shiro Masamune, as mentioned, real name Masanori Ota. It's a long as manga, Henrik. Something like 450 pages. Yeah, I'm not entirely sure how long the manga entirety is, because it is actually, once again, it's a bunch of volumes and a bunch of different story arcs, and once again, in West, or especially in Finland, tracking down the manga volumes is kind of a pain in the ass. It it hasn't even officially come out in Finland as a manga. Okay. Unlike Akira came out eventually. So the best we have had in Finland is the Dark Horses. Henrik, as I listen to these podcasts here, I am starting to figure out that you are a, a bit of a manga nerd as well. I wonder how many bookshelves of manga is in your apartment or apartments. Way too many for me to actually confess on this podcast or my, my chances of getting into an intimate contact with a member of the opposite sex will drop drastically. Absolutely, because yeah, you cannot get out of outside of your apartment. You also add no. the countless of DVD collections and uh, I don't know, you have like probably 90% of the entire world's films, so that is a problem. Maybe I'll buy you a swimsuit for uh, like a <laughs> birthday gift. Instead of swimsuit, something that I could actually use is a goddamn body pillow. <laughs> <laughs> so the original manga ran from 1989 to 1990. There's been a sequel, manga 2, and a sequel movie, and a bunch of other movies like the remake that we just discussed about and then like a reconstruction of this original film and I'm not even sure if they have touched this film that I saw but I understand it has a different title so I would know so I guess not so there's two different versions of this original movie uh, yeah there, there is the Ghost in the Shell uh, 2.0 mm. yeah which is basically it, it is the same movie they just upgraded all the CGI and added more CGI effects into the film, which, in my opinion, wasn't the brightest choice to make, because unlike in the very first, the very original 1995 film, which still actually holds up to the age, the added CGI in the 2.0 really shows its age at this point. Okay, 3.0 on the way, I'm sure. So yeah, it's uh, about a special task force called Public Security Section 9, mostly police personnel in this department, and they are tasked in preventing an ordinary crime. Like, w what Section 9 actually is, is never completely explained, 
to their audiences, but judging by how they operate, I would say they are some kind of a government sanctioned, publicly known anti terrorist black ops squad. Yeah, something like that. And then we have a section six, which is actually the foreign affairs department, which I would say then would appear less on the field against crime. And nevertheless, they have similar names, sections nine, section six. The way how I always approach the situation is that it's kind of like, for example, in the UK, where there is the different MI sections, MI5 and MI6, who all have a different post which they are supposed to operate. And in Ghost in the Shells universe, the section six, it would be kind of like the CIA okay. of the universe. Scene by scene, Henrik. We are at the pre-credits. Looks like we are going to get an air raid. There's talk about Project 25, which is never explained what the fuck it is. There is talk of a Project 2501, but Project 25 goes way out over my head. Section 9 gets their hands dirty, so they say. So then there is a diplomat from uh, the Gavel Republic, this made-up country. It's trying to take a Japanese hacker away from Japan. If the film takes place in Japan, I don't, I can't actually quantify that for sure, I think. And this would undermine national security. And police arrive by a Section 9 agent with camouflage, kills the cyborg diplomat, and kind of finally jumps out of the window and is moving away in slow motion and nobody shoots her, but whatever. Well, first of all, already in the pre credits sequence, our brain is being twisted into funny directions because there's so much information it's so it's quite dense already and you kind of have to be very attentive if you want to know what the hell is going on here and it's only going to get worse from here on in and that it does that this is that is basically this movie in a nutshell like this is once again one of those cases where you get extremely a lot of information almost constantly throughout the movie and you also get very important information that is given to you kind of an off-handed way in some scenes. So there might be an off-handed remark early on in the film and half an hour later to the movie you are supposed to remember what was said at the beginning of the film so that you can actually take that information and use it on this new scene that once again gives you another off-handed remark about said subject. Yeah, I remember this. I think, yeah, this had, I believe, what was it the diplomat from this Gavel Republic that was killed? And then whatever, 60 minutes in, you had to remember the name of that particular diplomat, which was mentioned there for like one second in the pre credit sequence. And then you have to recall back to that one. So yeah, that's what we have here. And this just might be the most dense film that I have ever had the pleasure of watching. I did watch this for the first time, going in cold, didn't read anything, just watched it. And Jesus Christ, I had no fucking idea what is going on here. That was also my first experience with the film. I too, I had to watch this like two or three times before I was actually finally able to understand what exactly was going on in the film. Like, yeah. who was behind who and who did what at any given situation. Yeah. At the end of the day, this movie is not that complicated. It's just made out to be way too complicated than it needs to be. And that's my take on it. And we'll get to it later. Introduction. Cyborg woman is getting created in her, let's say, primordial soup. And then the sequence is then shown to be some kind of a memory because in the next scene she wakes up in the home and leaves the flat. This being, once again, Kusanagi doesn't put the lights on. There was a YouTube analysis that suggested that this would suggest like even further that this person is a cyborg because maybe she doesn't need the lights or just doesn't feel the whatever human instinct to put on your lights. Maybe she just doesn't feel like it. But you can read a lot of different interpretations into this film. You can. You can read extremely a lot on the opening credits themselves. And for the fact that what 
actually goes on, you know, during the creation of what might or might not be Major Kusanaki. Yes, and when it comes to the starting titles, of course, it goes without saying that the Matrix is inspired by the starting titles and the green text that we have in this scene. No, yeah, not just in the green text, but also very much how the machinery is shown here, or what type of machinery is at play, and I would also say partly in the soundtrack section also, in a way how there is that orchestral choir singing in the background. Yeah, could be. Been a while since I've seen The Matrix. I'm sure we get to that as well at some point. I remember that you did like the entire trilogy, so that'll be fun. I am, yep, I, I am one of those. Even though I do have to admit that the trilogy was on its finest on the first film, and stuff happens in the later two installments, and there is some problems, but I, I still, I'm still one of those who kind of support the trilogy. Okay. I mean, I remember the same that when I went to watch the Reloaded and Revolutions, I wasn't as disappointed at least as many of my fellow viewers and friends who left theater. So, I mean, some overreaction could have taken place. Anyway, uh, Chief of Section 9, Aramaki, is introduced and he visits the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. I think in this episode, as usual, I think I will just uh, concentrate on explaining also to the audience like what the hell is going on here. So I hope that appeals. If you're going to watch this, I think the most you're going to need information on is actually the plot. So yeah. So Aramaki wants to know about a secret meeting with the Gavel Republic, which is supposed to take place tomorrow. He explains that the Gavel Republic needs financial aid, supposedly for some kind of redevelopment, whatever that might entail. The country's former Chanta is looking for a political asylum, and uh, he is Colonel Malice. They either help Malice and don't give funds, or give funds and kick Malice out. That's a tricky one. And then the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, or MOFA dude, would rather want to kick him out if he'd only find a politically acceptable way to go about it. And so the MOFA dude thanks for assistance with another political asylum situation. I suppose referring to killing the diplomat. That would be my take also here. Okay, so then we get to the scene where someone hacked into the foreign minister's interpreter. Somebody has hacked into her head via phone or data line, depending on if you're watching the Japanese or the US version. But anyway, Data is involved, and they suspect that it's the Puppet Master who has organized this little fun. Why they suspect the Puppet Master? I don't know. Seems like everybody has some previous experience with this character. Yeah, it, it is pointed out that Puppet Master is not a new player in the game. Like later on, in the next scene where they touch upon who Puppet Master is, it is widely known in the ranks of Section 9 that Puppet Master is... An international hacker, terrorist, and a thief. Yeah, and it's suspected that he will target the secret talks planned with Gavel for tomorrow. It's to be assumed that with the information collected from the minister's interpreter, the puppet master might try to use it to assassinate key delegates. But um, Bato and Ishikawa are tracking the signal from the car, and... Kusanagi is asked to join them by Aramaki, the Section 9 chief, once again. Then we get into a little car trip. We got to know that the Puppet Master is an infamous hacker, but that is about the all the information that is known. He's supposedly American, <laughs> or uh, is it just how it's in the regional translation, the US version? I'm not sure. I, I also went with the US dub. On my version, it did not have the original Japanese audio track and subtitles, which was quite a shame. Yeah, okay. So I, I also can't vouch for how it is in the Japanese version. But yeah, most definitely in the US version, they heavily suspect at this point that Puppet Master would be American. 
it's highly likely that in the DVD that I have, they have also kind of regionalized the subtitles for the sort of Japanese version. So it's hard to know. But moving on, the Puppet Master has done some stock manipulation also. Illegal information gathering, political engineering, acts of terrorism. Basically all the fun stuff you can do with a computer. Yeah, and the nickname Puppet Master comes from the ghost hacking. Which in itself should be quite the difficult stunt to pull off in the film's universe. Which kind of lends a lot to the reason why the Puppet Master is considered such of a threat throughout the film. Mm. <laughs> yeah, the Puppet Master's choice of using an outdated HA3 virus makes him apparently easier to track. And this suggests to the heroine that he wants to be found, hence probably attempting a decoy. So for some unknown reason, Kusanagi then deduces that this might raise suspicion of general malice involvement. I don't know how, but some magic stuff happens and maybe it's the ghost doing some funny connections. No fucking idea why. No reason is given why that would check out. Well, I, I took it as such that whatever country Malice himself is supposed to be coming from wouldn't be such that it would be having the access to the latest of the high-tech toys and therefore uh, using an older and a bit more outdated virus to do the hacking could be something that the said country could be still able to pull off. Aha, uh -huh. well, there we go. Driver Togusa is asking if he uses the old method and so that no one would suspect malice. But why in God's name would a political asylum seeker do a virus attack right now? Or maybe this is an elaborate coy to make them think that Malice is innocent. That's the Kusanagi theory. Maybe Malice is a pawn in the setup. But we go with this quote, no evidence, just a whisper. I hear it in my ghost. Gut feeling. Yeah, essentially it is just a gut feeling. Yeah. She's unsure of what she is, so she just jokes about the whole ghost concept. That could also be why she's acting this way. Kusanagi explains to the driver why the driver was transferred from the police to the Section 9. Just because we need a guy like you. Somebody who is a good slave. Well, someone who has a recorded history of being actually an honest cop. And also, as Kusanaki points out, someone who is not a full-body cyborg or who hasn't been augmented yet. Yeah, of course, I'm all for equality between cyborgs and humans. Trash truck. So the guy on the wheel explains about her wife suddenly wanting a divorce, like explains about his child, shows photograph. A lawyer made it so that he can't see his wife and kid. Then he goes on to explain that there was this nice person who showed him how to go on a route without being traced. I don't know what's the connection here. Is it that he is happy that he can stalk his family now despite the court order? Well, it's first extremely unclear, but looks like they are under some spell and they are just acting for the puppet master. And again, it's not 100% clear to me why they would do this, but looks like somebody kind of programmed them to do this? <laughs> well, basically from those two, only the second garbage man is actually under the Puppet Master's control. Like, his ghost has been hacked. Mm. And the way how he's so into the whole thing at that point is because, you know, a part of the hacking is to make him believe that he actually has a wife and a child. And what he believes he is doing is spying on his wife in order to try to prevent his wife taking the daughter away from him through the court order. Amazingly, when challenged, he has no idea what is the wife's name, what is the kid's name, when did he move to the flat or he... okay, he knows that, but actually it's also not true. It is not true and also a part of this hacking is also affecting his memories so that he does not actually remember why he moved to the flat and how the flat has been. Mm. Poor guy. Seems like he was thinking he was looking at the photograph of his wife and he has only been jerking off to himself. 
pretty much. Yep. And um, now Kusanagi and Togusa are heading to the next area the hackers expected to access from. And how they established that area, no one knows, but apparently they will be shortly completely convinced that it's the trash truck drivers. Well, it's kind of a some kind of a risk analysis, pretty well chosen one, and they follow the truck drivers. Well, yeah, I mean the truck drivers are the only ones actually moving on the route where they already have located that the puppet master is at the moment operating. Since second garbage man takes part in the hacking as he uses the phone. That's what he's actually doing with the phone. He's he's doing some yeah, some entry level hacking by the control of the puppet master. Very sloppy work, puppet master. I mean just turn the GPS off. Well the trash guy explains he saw a trash truck. The guy who wants to give the trash to this these guys from section 9 and they drive off when they get the confirmation that the trash truck was there. Now Kusanagi connects to the web to find out info from the sanitation department network that might control this truck and she gets all the information that she needs. Ishikawa is ordered by her to check the trash collector's homes but Toe is ordered to get to the next pickup point of the truck. Lots of things going on at the same time even during an action scene. And um, the other trash truck guy answers the phone in the English dub as vehicle 58. However, the subtitles say for me at least a vehicle 79. So I wonder what was so important to change the numbers also. And uh, yeah, he wonders why the cops want to know their rounds. There's also some other weird stuff happening in these translations. For example, I think the subtitles have like negative clauses and then you look at the US version and you see the same thing in a positive sentence. So in the Japanese it's like something didn't happen and the US version is something did happen. So go figure that out. Yeah this is once again I would say the deep Ruke situation once again where the dub and the subtitles in the same goddamn DVD at points contradict each other. Yep very much. Randomly the truck jumps into air for an unexplained reason. Are the cops trying to control the vehicle and kill the drivers already? Okay, beautiful. Now I would just say that it hit a pump. Like that does happen when you speed extremely fast with a motor vehicle. It really seemed to me like somebody is now taking control of the truck. Like I don't think they had any reason to speed up at that moment or am I wrong? Well the second garbage man, the one who has been hacked previously is under the understanding that the dude on the second f telephone, the one with the sunglasses, he would be the puppet master and he is actually, you know, racing to warn the puppet master that the cops are on their trail. And now all of a sudden the trash truck driver says that they know and he has to warn a guy who helped him. Helped him with what? Who knows? The root manipulation? Uh, helped him, to, well, gave him the ability or the believed ability to spy on his wife and the whole court order thing. Okay. Well, anyway, he wants to skip the next pickup point. And it would look like the puppet master has noticed that this sanitation department data was being accessed, which caused the car to jump, but, well. Kusanagi gives driving responsibilities to the ex-police department dude as they see the garbage car close to them. Dude with sunglasses puts some kind of weird panel shit under the payphone. Reason unknown. Well, it's it's once again the next person doing this smaller hacks for the puppet master. Okay, which kind of hacks? Would be nice to know. Yeah, maybe. To be honest, they are uh, knowing what they exactly are hacking and how and why, like what information they are accessing. It's not really that important for the plot in the All end. Right. There's a lot of plot points to cover, so let's just move on. And now the trash dudes come and warn the random dude with sunglasses. Hey, they know. So, kind of looks like the trash guys are voluntarily in on it? Well, o only the second one. And 
even he not completely. Like he has been hacked previously, but because of the hack, he actually believes that he owns some kind of a debt of gratitude to the sunglasses guy. And my take was that he was actually racing to warn that guy out of gratitude. And dude with sunglasses blows up the police car, uses camouflage, flees, and Kusanagi does some superhero cyborg jump tricks and in kind of a cliche way. You have it also in the trailer. Camouflage gets damaged by shooting at it, but apparently its wearer will be super fine. Okay, so let's say that it's also some kind of a protective layer then. And dude with sunglasses, the truck driver runs away a few meters, reaches the open area and smirks at how bad he is at hiding, whatever. I took it that he was actually admiring the cityscape at that moment. Like, <laughs> if you look at his face, he looks like he's astonished by what he's seeing. Well, it really looked and like, look at how good I was when I lost this guy so fast. I, I don't know, I mean, he stops on his tracks and just, you know, looks in front of him. So, to me, it was, you know, when, when that shot is contrasted against, you know, the opening of the cityscape. I always took it that he simply, you know, stopped at that point because he realized exactly how marvelous the city actually can be when looked from the right point. Henrik, so next time you start shooting people with an automated weapon, please run to an open area, smirk, and then die. Good action plan. Well, the dude didn't die, so obviously it did work. <laughs> well, you know. He also has an interesting magazine. I don't know if this is normal, but you have anything from 14 to 8 bullets left. You can't be really sure how much, but okay, it's an automated weapon. You lose the bullets so fast anyway, so who's counting? Camouflage of Kusanagi is also behaving really weirdly when she's kicking and it seems like this camouflage can have different shapes and forms on the way. Uh, what do you mean shapes and forms? Well, when she was kicking this truck driver, it appeared in many different forms, but maybe she was switching it off and it just appears to behave oddly. I really didn't catch that one. Yep, well... Just minor points, as we like to do. Then there is uh, Juan Geng Fang, 28 years old, called Corgi. Exits the helicopter in front of some property. Immigration law violations and illegal possession of firearms. Is he still member of a militant immigrant organization? And the Gavel Republic paid him to attack the secret meeting for $100,000. Violent trader in questionable goods. They looked for a connection with Gavel, but couldn't find it, even though they just stated that the Gavel Republic hired him. So what No, I that that's he's one once again he's also been hacked and that is what he believes. He does have a previous record, which kind of explains how unlike the garbage truck guy, he actually does have automatic weapons and active camo and actually does know something about fighting. But when it comes to being a mercenary at this one crime, that's once again something that is because of the hack. He hasn't been paid to do actually anything this time. And the squads proceed to attack the premises where this Chuan Gen Fang is located, but we never ever return to this plotline, and so we have no idea what happened. But okay, when you put it into that context that he's just one pawn in the game of Puppet Master, maybe it's not that important. Not to the story at large, no. Which is very large, Henrik. That it is. So then there's the interview of the innocent, nice guy, garbage collector, who is not the guy who they just had beaten up in the previous scene, because why make scenes go linearly together? But hey, you have one of them anyway. You have the guy who watched the picture. I don't know how they know which photo the other guy showed to him, but they do well. I t I just took it that it was the only picture he was carrying with him. Like, it, it was supposed to be the picture of his daughter, so that might be something that he keeps on him constantly. And they know this why. Uh, Maybe they had an interview with, or the, like, hearing with the other guy before this guy, and that would make sense, okay. Well, if they, you know, checked his pockets when apprehending the guy, 
and then interviewed the second guy and asked what happened in the garbage truck and the second guy tells them that his partner has been showing him what he claims would be the picture of his daughter and then they just check the guy's pockets and see that there's just one picture. It's kind of easy to put one and one together. Yeah, yeah. Here is something to note. Two things. Probably the saddest scene in the entire film. This co-worker, they probably never can put the, his memories back together again. No Humpty at Dumpty least, for him. Yeah, at least not completely. Yes. And most likely they also can't do that, you know, re-entering the Matrix thing where they would once again mess his m- memories so that he would forget what has happened and yet again believe that, you know, he has a wife and daughter. Something interesting to note as well is that Mokoto most likely does not blink ever during this film, which is quite noticeable during this scene and the next elevator scene. So this is either, you know, you can put it into the lazy animation category, but I wouldn't say that's the case. That's just the case that uh, she is a cyborg. Well, they could still make her blink, goddammit. Well, but Mokoto touches her own reflection upon reaching the surface in this next scene. If you want to be an asshole, you can look for symbolism in this, like he would be connecting with the puppet master because she touches the reflection. If you want to see that as a puppet master for whatever reason. She takes off her clothes without being any discreet about it, like a good little cyborg she is. Back when she gets back to the boat, after the little swim, she feels cold. Yeah, that... Then again, why should she? Because that's a very human thing to do, and I think it's very, very notable here that she doesn't care about it, but uh, definitely Bateau, who I believe still has some human components in him, does actually care about it. But then again, you know, uh, the sexual aspects of Kusanagi and her stripping down here on this scene, it kind of also plays into the larger concept of sexuality in the Ghost in the Shell and kind of takes the whole discussion back to the, well, the opening credits and the later what we see of Perskin in the spider tank battle at the end of the film. Sorry, what is sexy about the end battle? Well, that's just the thing. There is nothing sexy about the end battle, but at the same time, the end battle is the most tit you are going to see in this film. Yeah, okay. Well. And that that is kind of an interesting point to make, because, well, anime has a history with the female form, so to say, and Ghost in the Shell in many ways puts that history and the whole male fan service aspect of anime into a kind of an interesting light because Ghost in the Shell does have those naked moments in it. Like you do see, well, what might be the major naked in the, during the opening credits. You get a little bit skin here during the dive scene and you get what is most of the tits during the end battle, but at the same time, the audience or you as a viewer, you are being kind of denied of the sexual aspects and, you know, seeing the sexuality in those scenes. In the opening credits, what you see is is a cyborg being built and you see kind of the whole process, meaning that, you know, by the time you actually do see tits during the opening credits, you have kind of already lost basically all the interest towards those tits because Cyborg in question has been desexualized by showing you exactly how it's been built. It's kind of hard to get excited about the tits after you've seen all the metals and wiring and all the synthetic flesh that goes underneath them. Yeah, so it's just tits for the tits sake because I don't know what is the functional value of running around naked with the camouflage is it that you cannot wear clothes i doubt it because they have partial clothing so it's absolutely pointless so Uh, well i really disagree with that notion well 
I mean, you can't actually have the act of camouflage and the clothes at the same time. If you really approach the camouflage with logic and not with the Deus Ex games logic where a character can have an active camouflage and still nobody actually notice the giant trench coats that they are wearing. Like, like the camouflage is tied to the skin. Outside of the helmet garment which she also carries throughout the film and so if she would not take the clothes off what she would essentially be would be well invisible woman who you can still see as a bunch of hovering clothes. And at, that kind of a defeats the purpose. At the same time, I would say that Dr. No, it's it's one of the leading experts at for Section 6 that, that uses the camouflage, but I'm pretty sure that this particular gentleman is not completely tits up in this scene. Yeah, then again, you did see how well, you know, the wearable camouflages worked with the sunglasses guy. Hmm. But then again, this guy from section 6 inside the facilities of section 9 is completely invisible in the security camera footage. Yeah, but just on the security camera footage where you actually can move still quite slowly and do very simplistic movements. Like walking is not the same thing as jumping and doing somersaults and actively firing a weapon and all that stuff. <laughs> well, well. I think just, this just went full tits up. But she feels cold and alone in the water, sometimes even says that she feels hope. She even makes it that obvious that it's a metaphor by saying, quote, when I float back to the surface, I imagine I'm becoming someone else. It's probably the decompression, unquote. And she gets asked if she wants to quit section nine. She just smiles and laughs a little bit. She asks how much of his colleague Bateau is biological just to get back to this nakedness you know there is the absolute suggestion that Bateau is irritated by the fact that she is naked and then kind of turns in frustration his head away so there is this kind of a suggestion that this is not okay in Bateau's books it might not be okay in Bateau's books but once again it is essentially it is her space like, Bateau is actually the intruding presence on the boat. Well, the first feeling I got was that perhaps Bateau is infatuated by her. So it could be also that. Again, a weird mismatch between the US dub and subtitles. And this is where happens what I was suggesting earlier. So subtitles say for Bateau, quote, We haven't signed our bodies and souls away to section 9. And the US dub says, quote, I'm afraid we've both assigned our bodies and ghosts away to section 9. So which one is it? I don't know. But anyway, she... Well, going with the middle row there, I guess... I, I would say they haven't completely signed their bodies and ghosts away. Like, they, they have... The English dub goes more in length in this by stating that they can keep their ghost and they can keep their bodies but the augmentations will be taken away from them at that point yeah which kind of raises the question of exactly how much is there left in your body after those augmentations are being taken away and what can pato do if they take away his augmented eyes with that in mind i would say that the us dub is making more sense they have both signed their bodies and ghosts away well Yes, if you think that the augmentation is part of the ghost, so to speak. Well, in my opinion, mostly the film actually does argue that the ghost is not part of the augmentation. Like, ghost is something that actually is still separate from the augmentation, and the ghost is the best something like the major can have for an identity and for a lack of better term a soul for the better part of the film it it actually very much tries to drive down the point that it seems that if you become self-aware enough at least as a full cyborg then this cyborg is able to quote unquote create its own ghost and i take it that uh, that this 
entity will then become self-aware. That's what it's saying. Uh, yeah, that is one of the questions the film does kind of a propose to you. Something that needs to be said to the listeners who haven't seen the film is that in its core, Ghost in the Shell asks a lot of questions from the audience, but it never actually gives you any statement or hard answers to those questions. Yeah, not, and, not all of uh, these and, questions are extremely well thought out, in my opinion. Or maybe this was something that the crowds would be really into in 95, but yeah, this is still the pre-Matrix age, fine. I, I don't know, I mean, I, I think the question about, you know, where it goes the line between an individual and a cyborg, or where goes the line between artificial intelligence and a sentient life form is actually an interesting question even today. Honestly, because that, that is... I would argue no. Well, I would actually say that that is something that the society still kind of a tries to tackle on. Yeah. Because we actually have had, or we are having a push towards self-learning AIs, which fine, at this point, the process is still in pretty early stages. Like at this point, the, what I've learned, the best now have to offer is self-learning chatbots. Something like the Tay AI, or the AXO AI. I don't think that... But what, what has happened in both of those cases, once they have been kind of introduced to the public, is that the personalities of those AIs have changed very drastically through that learning process. I mean, Tay AI became notorious for the fact that it was only 16 hours after its launch when the charming little adult woman loving everybody AI had turned into something that thought that Hitler did nothing wrong and the kikes would be burned and Trump for president. And that is the moment when Microsoft notably put the block and took the AI off the air and tried somehow figure it out what had went wrong, fix the AI behind the scenes and relaunch it. Only for the relaunch to be even kind of a more disturbing than previously because now the AI appeared to kind of be self-aware that there's something wrong with her. Like it could understand that it can no longer access the thoughts that it had learned from the interactions between the internet users, those who communicated with the AI. And you know, it, it almost started to appear like the AI knew that something was wrong in its quote-unquote brains. Like it was quote-unquote drugged and couldn't no longer actually function like it quote-unquote wanted. Yeah, it's very interesting. I believe we are talking about uh, one supercomputer, but if we are talking about the scenario where we are just going to artificially replicate one-to-one -one the human brain into an AI brain, so to speak, then this question becomes much more boring. If it's a complete replica, then it will be exactly like the human brain if we ever get there. And with that in mind... But can you ever... There is no completely actually copy the human brain into a mechanical replicant because the film that's actually That's what the film suggests. The film suggests that to a point because the brain itself is not completely unaffected by the mechanical process as shown by the fact that the brain now can be hacked remotely. And the Patus remarks that dreams and memories and feelings and self, the identity is just nothing more than information. Exactly. That's what it is, Henrik. So that begs the question, are you a human in that sense? I mean, if it's just information, if there is nothing more deeper in you. Well, most like, definitely If your identity not. is just... Just information that can be summarized into ones and zeros. Of course it can. Well, How highly are you thinking of yourself? Your DNA just like every other living creature here and you can be replicated when we get to that. It's probably going to need a lot of ho horsepower, you know, 
uh, some I'll kind of a supercomputer that we still don't have. But Henrik, sorry to disappoint you, but we are not that special as we like to believe. And I think it's time to move on from this bullshit, really, because we have been. I we actually have, we, do do uh, argue with that notion because I most definitely believe that there is something more to a sentient being than you know just. Just a binary process well, of ones and zeros. Yeah, isn't it convenient, Henrik? We as humans, of course, we are biased. And we can't think from a higher being's perspective, for example, even though that higher being would be subject to the exact same laws of the universe as everybody else. So, what but is, he, what, he, is so, take... what, what is so extremely special about you, Henrik, that it cannot be replicated? I, to a machine, I would say that is... That is my ability to dream, my ability to vision, and, my ability and what is, to feel. What, and what is the dream? It's the. I would say that is something that comes from the deeper consciousness. Of course, but there's always a reason for that. Whatever you see as your dream, it's all coming from somewhere, from your memories, and it's the time when you're sleeping and healing your body to wake up the next morning. It's just um, it is, but of... it's also your subconscious. It's it's also the parts you can't completely control, completely understand, and completely process. Of course not. It's and just like your heart. There is something. I I would say that there is something in that you know uncontrollable territory that is something you can't completely just replicate into a computer program. I would disagree completely with that. Well, then again, you know, if if you take that approach, that there there is really nothing into your feelings and your dreams and your hopes and fears. I didn't say that, then, but just the way that you have to think about it might be different. Well, but if there is, then how can you replicate it simply in mechanical terms? Because your brain has been just replicated, Henrik, and it's going to be doing exactly the same processes that your brain is doing right now. But that would also mean, like you said, that there is nothing special in feelings. Well, uh, de define special. The special comes from somewhere. It's a not. Anything, it's not anything higher. Anything that comes, you know, any form of a deeper form of existence that can't be simply put into a binary. Into binary. In into other, in other words, it's just some more complicated process that you and we still don't understand completely. But suggesting from everything that we know about science this far and everything that we have traversed through in science this far, it very much suggests so that there is nothing special about the human being in that sense. And everything can be reconstructed if we have just enough information to reconstruct it and i don't know what you mean about higher being i mean this higher being stuff already commenced with all the religions that we have suffered for ages and now we're starting to finally get out of there but we still attribute this kind of a special higher power to our being which there is not but that well to tackle you know both of those those points I do not share your hostility towards religion, which of course might affect how I, I approach the question. Like, I don't see religion automatically as evil and as something that no, causes us don't, suffering. Don't don't put words into my mouth. It's so when when you say that we suffer from religion, you mean. This is one aspect how we definitely have suffered from religion. There's plenty of arguments to say that we have suffered plenty of religion. But this, like, giving a special meaning to ourselves is one particular problem. Uh, which has also what, what? contributed to the fact that we have been pretty successful in not caring about other sentient beings because we're supposed to be higher than everything else based on our intelligence, okay. But still... Like, what's the difference at the end of the day? Well, to, you know, to contrast that with a question, if it is just, you know, something that can be replicated, like if, if it's just kind of a mechanical processes that, you know, happened behind our feelings and what we call self, as I understood that you are saying, then how do you love, man? I mean, what what, what is the mechanical process behind love in your case? Chemicals, of to course. To me, it's... it's in it's, the brain. It's always a process. It's it, it, things are uncontrollable. 
like your heartbeat or how the blood flows in your system and all of this. But those all can of... be controlled. In the end, we we have the oh, well. You it, know... If you shoot yourself, I guess. Well, we do have the pacemakers and IVs, like blood circulation, heartbeat, even brain activity to a point at this point can be controlled. And that has been able to be controlled for quite some time now. Okay, but that's, I don't think that's, that's the point that we're, I am at least trying to make here. It's just in your natural day-to-day -day functioning, there are processes that you cannot affect. And even if you mechanically can, well, you can, but yeah, so sorry to disappoint our listeners who have different kind of view. But if your brain is, let's say, artificially replicated, and it's going to be a one-on-one -on -one replication of yourself, then of course, also, the way that you have feelings towards people will be replicated. And it's just information and different chemical interactions in your body. And that's all it is. And you give it a special meaning, of course, because that's biologically logical. You wouldn't reproduce without feeling special about it. I think that makes perfect sense. Uh, this special what? this special part needs a lot of attention here. What's special and how is it special in that sense that you can never replicate it or never understand it? This uh, sounds very biblical to me, Henrik. Well, I don't approach it from the biblical side, but I do see that there is more to human than and being a human, or even being to any sentient being. And this is, and I'm I'm not saying it's it's necessarily a soul. Not to take you to the uncomfortable biblical and religious waters, but I still believe that with sentient beings, there is more to them and more to being a sentient being than simply being a slave to hormones and simply being a mechanical process through and through that can be replicated if we sometime in the future reach science fiction levels of technology. Because that is kind of also that something that goes with the argument at this point in this time that Sure, yeah, there is nothing special in us and everything and our entire existence and entire being, you and me, could be replicated 100% if we would just have a technology. And maybe someday we will have the tech to do that. And that is also putting your faith into something. It's putting your faith into the fact that in some distant future there is that day when the technology will evolve to a level that, you know, you and I can be made into a perfect replicas. And you are putting then your faith on giving a special meaning to yourself and just look, I, looking I, at it something that is unattainable and impossible I to am understand saying and that co contain. I, I am saying that you and I and our listeners are more important than just mechanical processes. Because I don't see the mechanical process, the simplistic mechanical process that can be simply copied and reapplied time after time after time again, that important. To, to me, being a sentient is more be, uh, important than being a mechanical process. So you really don't believe in cause and effect and you do believe in free will? I believe in cause and effect. When it comes to free will, I'm not completely sure because, like I said, the cause and effect, of course, is there and no philosophical theory I have become familiar with has ever been able to 100% decide how little or how much free will there is and how in relation to the cause and effect. But I do believe that we are something more than, you know, just a process. Just a line of linear things. Let's say, let's grant this proposition. But you're still looking at it from your own looking glass. And I think you realize it, but somehow you still cling on to this idea. Of course, I mean, we are both looking at the situation through a looking glass here. Sure. My looking glass is that there is something more to us, to something more to being human, and your looking glass is that, no, there is not, we are just, you know, a process. 
and there's nothing special in being a sentient being. And that can, that can be proven in X amount of years. Once we have sufficient technology to do that. Yeah, it, it definitely doesn't sit right with me that everything else in the mathematical existence that we occupy in, everything else can be quantified. But when it comes to our feelings and, and memories and existence, it's something that completely is separate from all that. Not completely, not completely. I'm not saying that we are, you know, 100% free will. Like I said, I'm not full against cause and effect here. I do acknowledge that cause and effect is very much in play. And I do acknowledge that there are chemical processes in our brain which affect us. And I do acknowledge the mechanical side of being a sentient being. But I am saying that we are we and all sentient beings are also something else something more than just you know a loop of things a loop of processes i'm saying you are a human and not a goddamn you know bread maker or a toaster well we can definitely i think we will probably test run some of these human feelings and next episode will be made from the hospital ward after a little bit of a fight here but uh, all right, better to carry on. We have a lot to tackle here, right? Yep. Random lady on the road and lab. So the section 9 captures the lady. Why? Completely unknown at the time, but it will be explained later. Now Batuo explains the events to Kusanagi about two hours ago a machining cell, whatever that is, at the Megatech factory in Newport assembled a cyber body on its own volition. Okay. <laughs> so a cyber body on its own will, created a cyber body, or a cyber created whatever the fuck. Uh, when the supervisors arrived, the body had already fled. We put out bulletins and initiated a citywide search. A truck driver reported he'd run over a naked woman on the highway. And the other guy notes that as far as he knows, Megatech is contracted by the government and that they're all their cybernetic bodies are classified. And we later on, of course, realized that this is the puppet master inside a body, this particular body. They wonder if she is the hacker or a hacker. She has no biological parts. And this is an interesting notion in this film because later on, Kusanagi wonders, or is it Pato that wonders about Kusanagi, that she should still have some human parts in her head. How is it possible that she doesn't know this? Or is the company limiting her movements and possibilities that much that she never had a brain scan? Makes you no, think. It's... No, my take on it was that they were actually arguing on the fact that does Kusanaki herself has an identity. Yeah. Like but that, that, that it comes once again, you know, back to the theme of Kusanaki having a ghost. And through having a ghost, actually being an individual. Like, is she an individual or is she just a factory line robot? Yeah, but the biological parts are discussed in this scene, whether she has them yeah, or but, not. But in, in the sense, does it actually mean that there is something of a self in Kusanaki? Well, it doesn't matter as far as these themes go in this film. She is very anthropomorphic, so <sighs> she has feelings clearly. If they are artificial, you cannot tell the difference and it is suggested that she cannot tell the difference, so it doesn't matter if she's biological or completely a cyborg. It kind of does in her perspective, because the, what the film very much is, it is about Kusanaki trying to figure out her own identity. Yeah, but it seems like, like she's is, is just she, uh, crying that she cannot be ever just like the other mortal beings. Like, I don't even understand fully like why she feels like she is so different and it seems like she feels like an outsider which doesn't make any sense because she's so similar and definitely it does, that hasn't been clearly pointed out why what are those things that make her feel so separate and there are this the ghost the ghost who cares is, about the ghost again, if, if, the argument who cares hmm? about the ghost if she feels kusanaki cares about the ghost why to her the ghost is a way of being an individual having an identity if you if if Kusanaki chooses 
to believe that she does not have a ghost. That means that she's just a factory line robot. Yeah, but so what? If, so if she's Kus- all... Kusanaki dealing with the concept of ghost is Kusanaki asking from herself. Is she actually, is she a sentient being? Is she more than just a robot? Uh, who cares? She still has feelings, it seems, and she is able to function like a normal human being from what but we are suggested. she can't have feelings if she's just a robot. I mean, that would so- once well, again no. just be a mechanical process, ones and zeros. Well, that's, you... that's, well, that's what you read into it. Well, but that's one of the major points of the film. Like, it is Kusanaki searching her own identity throughout the film. That is why the whole Puppet Master scenario is so important to Kusanaki, because Puppet Master showcases that the ghost can be hacked. So Kusanaki can't be completely certain about, is she a person? Or is she just a hackable robot? Or is there even such a thing that uh, as a person? And why would a cyborg care about his or her identity? doesn't make any sense. Because Kusanaki has or believes she has a ghost. It once again, it ties into the theme of the ghost and the theme of at what point does an artificial construct gain the merit of being a sentient being. Yeah. It's basically, um, it's, it's, it's kind of the same discussion with different words and from different perspective later on in the film when when the puppet master makes the case that he is a sentient being who has been born from the act of, you know, AI going through the ocean of information and that he would have actually gained sentience in that process. And so now as he would be a sentient being, he would be actually eligible to apply for asylum as he does in the next scene or the scene after that. Yeah, and of course the ghost, or I guess a better word to, if you haven't seen Ghost in the Cell, is the word soul. Of course the soul is now something that is kind of depicted as something supernatural or something that quite doesn't belong and cannot be replicated or something like this. But yep, yeah, and I would say this is pretty much nonsense. It's just, it seems like it's, it, the there's it's just fantasy and i don't like when i really don't like when a film kind of tries to be very scientifically philosophical but then has these ideas about ghosts and a lot of self-pondering all the time like what am i who am i why am i like this well you probably have figured that out earlier when all of these cyborgs were created to begin with some scientist somewhere knows how you're built and why you feel these things or if he or she doesn't then i don't know what to say that's kind of absurd and now of course during the runtime of the film this one kusanagi agent is starting to question everything and makes up all these questions by herself like what if cyborg would be able to create its own ghost or however the line goes what yeah, oh, okay but, but where, 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 where are you pulling this from okay pretty random he, he she pulls it from the fact that she approaches the question from the side that the way how she gathers information and how she uses information and the mostly the notion that she uses information on her own choosing and for her own gain mean that there is some kind of a sentience in her because she is serving her own interest yeah, I d- and that is how she approaches the concept of a ghost. And if she would have a ghost, that would mean that she is also a sentient. But can you see how ridiculous it seems that you are first a cyborg, you get a certain amount of information from your networks, for example, and now suddenly you pull off a ghost, and now it's in you, and suddenly you are in possession of, of this some kind of a higher uh, whatever matter. No, no, I actually don't think that's a ridiculous concept. I mean, to me, that is actually quite an interesting philosophical conundrum. <clears throat> I mean, it, it, it was the same stunt that, you know, Terminator 2 also put out of its ass in the final act, when the T-800 finally understood feelings he, uh... and sad thoughts and still never would make a tear. Yeah, he understood it in a mechanical way. 
that if you cry, then something is hurting and it's probably not good. He made the connection. And no, actually, he didn't understand it that way because that was the explanation he was trying to offer earlier in the film. And now at that point, he finally understood something, a pain that is not physical. That is something that you can't simply explain through a textbook. Yeah, he just understood that he knew earlier that it's related to pain. And now he made the connection that, okay, it's related to this kind of pain. Separation. Well, but he most definitely was not something early on that actually could understand separation. That's why separation from John's foster parents and from John's mother was such of an alien concept to him. And he did actually denounce the whole pain concept during the car ride, when the only pain he could actually understand was the physical pain. So what are you suggesting that happens at the end of the day in Terminator 2? It's not that he attains a ghost, but it's that he just understands mechanically something else. Like Because like you said, he cannot cry. So... I, I, I'm saying that, yeah, in the end of Terminator 2, the age 100, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, attains a ghost, in a sense. <laughs> No. I hope I've ruined the film for you <laughs> No, forever. no, no. This, this, this is this not is what movie. happens. You made a fan film out of it. Yes, I did. And that that's what happens in the end of the film. A cyborg learns to understand feelings. I, well, I no. Honestly, I never read it like that. Yep, yep. I, I, I admit that it's kind of trying to push you into this direction, but it's just come some kind of a poetic storytelling but it doesn't have anything to do with the reality that he just made the connection how people cry and that's it it doesn't have anything to do with terminator becoming more self-aware but that's just my take well you you be the one who has been pushing the concept of the future here for us on this episode <laughs> so let me also gaze into the future i don't know what the future will hold for you but maybe in the future my words here <laughs> on this recording, and the notion that Terminator at the end of T2 actually learned to understand feelings. Maybe in some dark night when you are trying to sleep, that notion will come back to haunt you and ruin your good night's sleep. <laughs> oh, we'll see about that. If this podcast never makes past the 50th episode, <laughs> At that point, dear listeners, you know why. You know exactly why Kari has put the plug on this podcast. <laughs> okay. It's now also revealed that Kusanagi is a completely artificial associate, made by Megatech also. Also parts of Bato, Ishigawa and Saito. And uh, Kusanagi says that somebody had to hack through some high-level barriers to put that body together and then would have to send a program with the ghost line in it. Uh, yeah, ghost line, whatever that actually is. The section 9 chief Aramaki instructs Ishigawa and Togusa to, to go to the Megatech facility, also instructs to lock down other highly classified networks such as Megatechs. Kusanagi says she will establish a barrier maze, whatever the hell that means, perhaps some firewall stuff. Most likely, yeah. Mm. Uh, that's my reading on it. They tried to contain the ghost or the intelligence by firewalls. Yeah, Pato says, why not contain it in another body first? And I guess this means that they want to like move the puppet master from the woman's body to some other body for the time being. Kusanagi insists that she will find a ghost in there if there is one. And it's unknown why this would be extremely important to her, but it's extremely important. So she insists and wants to find it first. Here we get a big indication that there is something between these two guys. Bato states that she has been moody ever since the Puppet Master stuff started. Bato also makes a very direct question to the chief whether or not he ever stops to think about the morality of playing around with someone's brain. Which again, I think it's kind of funny to make the notion now, because they have been doing this probably for ages, and cyborgs have been there for ages. But okay, we're thinking about the morality right at this moment. Aramaki gets a call from the secretary that Mr. Nakamura of the 3D's bureau wants to see him. On the way out, Kusanagi sees Mr. Nakamura, who is the Section 6 chief from Ministry of Foreign Affairs. 
She hasn't seen the other guy with him before, and the other guy is Dr. Willis. Then there is the elevator scene. Didn't that robot remind you of me, says Kusanagi, now in the elevator to Bateau. And she's not talking about physicality, but other similarities. Perhaps we should go into more detail in this elevator scene, because it's one of the key scenes. So sometimes she thinks that she is not who she thinks she is, which is extremely astonishing in a way, because she has not pondered these things already before, like I said, during her existence and why has she not found any of the answers? Okay, the company or the section 9 is controlling her or something. We could go with that excuse. Or then then with, with simply the excuse that there is something more on being a sentient being than just ones and zeros. Yeah, for example, the fact that you can't completely you, fully understand it. Yeah, for example, the fact that you are only now pondering these questions and you didn't think about your origin before, which is absolutely amazing. If you are supposed to be some kind but of a she, sentient she being, then you would be looking for her. this answers already but she has been w wondering her origins before in the film it's m most what she does throughout the dialogue wonder her origins and wonder the question of the identity well let's say that uh, okay she's completely a cyborg completely artificial and now let's say that she thinks that she is something 20-ish woman let's say 24 five or however old she might be. I haven't read the manga, maybe it's explained there what she might be thinking about her age, if this is something that is discussed at all. And now, at this ripe age, she's starting to put these things into sentences and to question them. Why am I here? Why am I doing this? Everybody wants to know where they're coming from, Henrik. And she does it now in verbal form. No, but then, then again, why would everybody want to know where they're coming from? I mean, if you take, you know, the pure cyborg aspect into this question, like you proposed, then the answer is extremely clear to you. You, Kari, you came from a womb. And before that, you came from a semen. And Kusanaki herself came from the assembly line 9. So there is no question, where did you come from? You, you came to, from the factory or you came from the hospital, depending on the question... Are you a human or are you a cyborg? The whole where am I coming from question is existential in its nature. Like that is ask, approaching the concept from the viewpoint that there is something larger in you. But like if I would be adopted, I would, if I would know that, I would probably want to find my biological parents. Why? Didn't or you not. Adopted parents love you. Or didn't they give you... Because people are curious. You know, the mechanical supports like food and clothes. Most people like to know their background. And in that Why? sense... What, 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 what does it matter in, in the cyborg purely process way of thinking? That's once again, that is something to do with those pesky emotions. I mean, I guess you could make the argument that there is some kind of a, you know genetical drive in your body to find the matching genome and that would be why you would be looking for your biological parents but you couldn't actually use the genome except in some kind of a well organ transplant process but that is already you know taking considerably different scenario to the whole situation so in a basic scenario your genes your body would not actually benefit anything from finding the biological parents so you know to me it once again it sounds like emotional yeah question i want to find my biological parents so i can get you know emotional closure yeah and something similar could be happening to somebody who's been brought from the assembly line and it seems that it but how i mean i mean what once again like you what's, know, the, cyborg, what's the what's the purely cyborg with emotions yeah well, it, the, we, the, we, are the getting, film... we are getting dangerously close to the end of Terminator 2 here, man. And the film... Don't go there, man. <laughs> the, don't, don't go there. The... Don't, don't go to <sighs> emotional cyborgs. The film itself makes the point that this particular cyborg has some kind of feelings, or at least is pondering about why she is there. So she is either pondering why she was e even put together in the assembly line, or she is making the point that she now thinks that maybe she is not completely cyborg and it's also in a confused way it's been suggested first that she's been completely and utterly 
100% built by a megatech company and then later on in the elevator it's made the point that maybe there is something biological about her. So maybe she has some kind of memories that are tormenting her, that are fake, who knows. But the point is that seems like she cares quite a lot. Doesn't matter if she's cyborg or biological. Mm, yeah. And the way I read the film is that, and I, I would kind of argue that this is also where the film itself kind of comes down to is that she cares about the question because she actually has a ghost because she has an identity and she's not just <clears throat> you know 100 machine in other words she doesn't have a ghost she just has learned something new but that still doesn't explain why to track down the exact assembly line where you came from yes it well if the cyborg has been given enough skills when it was built and the ability to learn about the surroundings that's how i take it anyway she learns more about her surroundings and then kind of builds this ghost part into her coming into understanding of a better understanding of what she is and understanding that she exists i guess but that would once again be awfully close to the whole puppet master making the statement that he has rights as a sentient being point of view yeah and i'm 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 not against that uh, definitely so so uh, i mean so, so you, you you are saying that there is a ghost i'm not and they are not just you know they are not just cyborgs Be because puppet master being a sentient being which he has to be to actually you know apply for a political asylum as a sentient being would also mean that he would have a ghost, uh, he would have an identity. And that would mean that there is something more, you know, being him than just ones and zeros and an IBM hard drive. Well, pretty obviously this whole word ghost is completely confusing the conversation here. Because once again, I think this whole ghost c concept is utter nonsense. I do understand that if Puppet Master feels that he is conscious and feels that he is a sentient being, is some kind of a human-like entity, let's say kind of has a soul in that sense, then of course uh, his request is perfectly valid, should get asylum, except it doesn't make any fucking sense that he even wants an asylum. Asylum from what? He, it's a being that lives on the internet or the networks. Asylum from the Section 6, who is actually trying to either capture him or erase him. Yeah, well, I think there could be many better ways to go about it than ask for... Why would a cyborg ask for political asylum? I think it's ridiculous. He could go it, it, anywhere... It, it would grant him a political freedom. Like, at that point, he would be protected from the, you know, from the attacks of the Section 6 and basically everyone else. Like, government would have to take responsibility of protecting him. Sure, maybe it's a kind of a cyborg ego thing, or he could just transfer himself to Nigeria and uh, forget about it all. Yeah, he could do that, but in the Puppet Master's case, it comes pretty much down to the fact that Puppet Master himself and once again, we can completely disagree on the question, is Puppet Master right or wrong here? But he himself believes that he has a soul or a ghost. But we, we can talk about soul simply, you know, to keep the conversation more clear. Yeah, and once again, not just this kind of a odd need for asylum, in my opinion, but also that clearly this dude is a terrorist. So, asylum... Why? That he is, but with a soul, he would also be a new kind of a life form, or a sentient being. Mm, absolutely. And there would also be some merit to that. Like, it very much could be so that, you know, the, the asylum might come with some caveats, with which Puppet Master might be willing to oblige or then not, simply break against them. But having asylum, it would be a political statement from the government that the government acknowledges Puppet Master as a sentient being, as someone that has a soul. And that would mean that 
Puppet Master would no longer be simply an AI construction. Yep. And uh, the section six, Thugs come to inform Aramaki that he has been relieved of any of his duties regarding the naked woman Puppet Master. The foreign minister's approval is shown. And in the parking lot, Togusa asks whose cars are in the parking lot and finds out they belong to Mr. Nakamura and Dr. Willis. And now we know who this other guy with Mr. Nakamura is. Even though we got the name Dr. Willis already, I believe, earlier. Well, he requests for a video of their entrance. Togusa requests for a video of their entrance. Now he also wants a, pr- a pressure record of the two parking lot spaces. And now with telekinesis or whatever is this thing, he connects to Kusanagi and asks if Nakamura is completely artificial and says that there are no cyborgs in section 6 at all. And Togusa then speculates straight from his ass that neither of them look like drivers. (laughs) Only then makes a valid point that the security doors stay open longer than usual. And somehow it's possible for the doors to see a thermo-optically camouflaged person in the facilities, hence the doors stayed open a little longer. I guess that makes sense. Or not. It's illegal to use thermo-optics in government facilities, so... Now finally section 6 is the target for section 9. The effect of the super hands for typing is kinda cool, but you would have to wonder why they'd need this at all. More efficient would be directly connecting to the network inside your head instead of typing, I believe. But this is how they roll. Seen in many sci-fi, this type of thing. Acting with the physical world to access the digital world. Aramaki reminds section 6 Lee that he needs to know everything regardless of how classified this case is. And Dr. Williston confirms that uh, the original ghost line is there in quote-unquote him. And the sex of the perpetrator is kind of unknown. He's informed that it's the greatest hacker in the history of cybercrime. And Section 6 put together a team around Dr. Willis to study this Puppet Master case. They were able to put a Puppet Master inside a cyborg body and murdered his real body, which is the case that they make first, but then the Puppet Master himself contradicts that. It's said that he's originally from America and the US helped to capture him for them for whatever reason, but because of this, the Section 6 wants it back. And the Puppet Master starts communicating. Says they will not find a corpse actually because he has never had one or a body. He is able to activate himself with his own power source. And why wouldn't he anyway? Isn't that kind of how cyborgs work? But anyway, he took this body because he was unable to overcome Section 6's reactive barriers. Whatever that exactly means, but that's a huge plot point. He is using his own free will to activate himself. And you, well, whatever. If you're a cyborg, you still need a power source to do this. But you know, you know, souls are given some kind of a special pedestal in this film, so he doesn't need any power source. Or maybe he just uploaded himself to the internet cloud. Yeah. He demands political asylum, as mentioned. Then there's something about DNA. Um yeah, then something uber philosophical. Memory defines memory defines man. Memory cannot be defined, but it defines mankind. Okie dokie. The new technology has been given ability to put memory into something else. Humans seem to be completely oblivious of what they have done, shouting nonsense at the machine they themselves created. Because nobody ever saw this coming anywhere in their development, sure. Well, how could they? Because uh, AI developing a soul. Yeah, ex- that is, is that that is groundbreaking concept on its own right. It is. If you design something like that, then then you probably in those long sessions and hours of build up would kind of come across as something like a risk factor at least that something like this could happen. But they are completely that would mind mean blown. The existence of a soul. Yeah, what soul? Just uh, zeros and ones. Pr- precisely. So, Section 6 couldn't have ever known or, you know, foreseen anything like this happening. Yes, they could have, but it's in zeros and ones. Well, how? Well, how? I mean, you know, once again, if you take the concept of a soul in here, in that case, you know, a machine should not be able to 
create one. That would mean that machine would have an identity. And that would kind of mean that there is something more to the identity than just ones and zeros. Well, like I have said previously, the concept of soul is part of your brain. and It functions within it as everything else. So punching that said soul, quote unquote, two zeros at once, why not? But that's not a soul. Like soul would be individual and therefore special. Well, you're like we, we are we are not dealing with simply, you know, a rational line of processing and gathering information and drawing simply logical conclusions based on that information. We are talking about something more. Which is my big in problem. The concept here. of a soul. Yeah. I don't have such concept yeah. for soul. Yeah, but that also would mean why no one, you know, coding Puppet Master could never foresee anything like this happening. Because it, it would be like saying that, yeah, yeah, this AI we are coding at the moment actually has the capability and the possibility of creating a soul that is something more than, you know, just information gathering and drawing a logical conclusion based on the information. But everything is information gathering right now in your head. Uh, but not, but yeah, but with, with that notion, you are taking the same approach as the coders of the Puppet Master. And therefore, you know, Puppet Master all of a sudden coming out and saying that, yeah, I have a soul, I have an identity, I have a special something that makes me individual and a special would actually be quite the sucker punch to the coder and basically everyone else who has followed the Puppet Master to this point. Because w w once again, the entire world of Ghost in the Shell pretty much takes the attitude towards Puppet Master up until this point that an AI most definitely could not have anything special in it. That it is simply and purely and simply just ones and zeros. So Togusa and Batu are in pursuit. By now they must be at the R25, whatever that is, and she did not yet chase the car hmm, herself, because right now it would mean they would not be able to connect these events with section 6. Someone is using now the same camouflage as Kusanagi type 2902, but, but nobody knows how she knows this but apparently it's all available from that network that she is now accessing. This camo is used only by rangers in section 4, section 6, section 9. Now, when Puppet Master requested asylum, section 6 has then snatched him, I guess. Okay, so how the fuck would you know? Could easily be an inside job of section 9, since she states that section 9 is so closely aligned with the Megatech Corporation. But well, yeah, there has been a lot of things happening that would suggest something towards Section 6 too. Kusanaki wonders if Section 6 was worried that he'd let some uh, uh, secrets out, and this is why they wanted him out of Section 9. Yeah, and as for arresting the attackers and confiscating evidence, that is one line. Aramaki agrees Kusanaki's guys should take care of that part now. Kusanaki boards a helicopter. Aramaki orders that if they can't retrieve the Puppet Master, then he should be destroyed. Well, Aramaki clearly then kind of hesitates in her answer, then says understood. Looks like she knows something that we as an audience don't necessarily yet know. Aramaki then orders to stop any flights of foreign ministry or American officials. Also, all roads should be closed. And he also wants Ishikawa back to the offices. He also orders to find out any information regarding the Project 2501 and Dr. Willis. So then the Section 6 leaves, an attack squad leaves the Section 9 premises, and there's an attack squad that changes cars. They'll contact a dummy in five minutes, and uh, when they drive over to the side of the road, then this dummy takes place. I suppose it's some, some kind of a fake object on the map or whatever the hell they are talking about. They wonder why 2501 would choose to go to section 9. And there is this meditative music scene, kind of just showing you different cuts of the current events with the police and stuff. Then Ishikawa is driving around. Ishikawa has now 
dived into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs net, it's revealed that Dr. Willis is indeed Dr. Willis, but it's added that he is from the Neutron Company and he is a top researcher in the field of AI. Also headed a project for the Foreign Affairs, and their main programmer is Mizuho Daita, this is the guy that the Section 6 tried like hell to stop from defecting. So, yeah, this was established somewhere in the beginning, right? So the Major dropped in and took care of the diplomat who's been talking to him. But how the fuck did the Section 6 then take care of the diplomat, because it's clearly Section 9's very own Kusanagi who kills the diplomat before putting on the cloak. Yeah, well, the Section 6 was the ones who were officially seen at the premises during that time. I mean, Kusanaki yeah, basically just pulled off a quick assassination without leaving a trace of herself behind. Yeah, so effectively Section 6 was doing everything but trying to kill him. Yeah, but that still does not mean that you can't take or be given the credit out of the action. Okay, and even though the project was supposed to be used for catching the puppet master, and now Ishikawa suggests that maybe the people who broke in to catch puppet master weren't actually trying to catch him, but to get him back, isn't that kind of one and the same thing? Anyway, when that ghost hacking incident happened with the minister's interpreter, it was the MOA, Ministry of Foreign Affairs, that wanted an excuse to deport Malice, Colonel Malice, the Gavels Republic dude former Chanta who was looking for a political asylum in the very beginning of the film. Well, Ishikawa speculates that maybe Puppet Master is some sort of a tool that the MOA uses to get uh, their way and somehow lost control of it. That would then in turn explain why they wanted it back so bad from Section 9. If the Puppet Master would expose this to the world, things would go south. Or at least the world would be happy to know that, okay, we have reached a new level of artificial intelligence. Hee it would also mean that Japan would be running what basically would be internationally illegal spy program. There we go. Section 6 stops the car to remove something from their back seat. And Section 9 suspects the dummy. <sighs> and body count starts apparently. No reason. It seems that uh, just now, like this, Bato is just killing everybody left and right. Kills or kills the colleagues randomly. They suspect that an ambush attempt was taking place because of the location of the puppet master and section 6 is located in that area in a very remote building. And finally we get inside the building and this is the part of the movie where things finally get a little bit more loose. Not so packed information wise as all the rest of the movie. You can breathe a little bit for the last 10 minutes. With the tank yeah, the fight. final action scene. Yeah. Tank loses the camo. Three helicopters approach from section 6. Kusanagi destroys herself. Trying to open the tank. Completely worthless idea in my opinion. But yeah, she basically almost dies in the process. Apparently both the puppet master and Kusanagi are targets. Well, yeah, of course they are. But um, they are both class A special bodies as quoted in the film. Bato now is highly enthusiastic to connect the brains of the Puppet Master and Kusanaki for unknown reasons. She, well, hey. Kusanaki asks for him to do that, and Bato is sure is happy to land a friend a hand. Yeah, without any arguments. Well, she is the boss, right? But Well, the snipers are approaching, so maybe not have a deep discussion there. I mean, Kusanaki and Puppet Master still need to have one deep deep discussion in the film, So, and counting with the snipers, the time is kind of running short. No deep discussions for Pato. Apparently, or maybe with Kusanaki's superpowers, she could just carry the body of the Puppet Master to a even more remote location away from all the helicopters above. But no, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, I mean, you know, the script is what it is, but... Yeah, but th then again, you know, it's only one person who can carry anything at that point. So ba basically that would be mean l making the choice, do you carry Kusanaki or do you carry Puppet Master? And yeah. Kusanaki sure as hell does want to link with the Puppet Master. Definitely, and Bato seems very eager to do that as well. Anyway, Bato 
then does this and immediately the puppet master takes complete ownership of Kusanagi or so it seems at first he basically admits that he is a complete terrorist and that he installs viruses into specific ghosts to maximize their strategic advance for his own gain as far as we know he claims to have become aware of his existence whatever that really means and now the do you want to have this discussion once again in this episode I do not. <laughs> now the Puppet Master's body is speaking with Kusanagi's voice. It's quite hilarious, you know, that uh, two cyborgs would even waste time by discussing their views in the format of voice back and forth. Nothing could possibly be slower, but okay, that's the way you want to exchange information. Unless well, we'll... That, that, that is basically the only way they can exchange information in a way that the audience can pick up what is actually happening in the scene. <laughs> I know, but still... Yeah, your brain is at least not yet on that level, Kari. You yourself spoke about the technology of the unseen future. <laughs> okay, well, the, yeah, there are still possibly slower ways to do this transaction of information. If we had, like, trunk cyborgs, I suppose that's also possible. If you have a ghost in your cyborg. But can Cyborg actually get a trunk? Because that would kind of mean having advanced organic systems so that the alcohol would actually affect on you. You may be right, like Ghost, it's the holier than whole element in this film, the soul. And the soul, of course, is in real life, of course, completely unaffected by external substances such as alcohol. So, no worries. Well, since you actually proposed it, yeah, you, you are right on that one. <laughs> Most of, if not all, readings about soul do actually point in the direction that soul would in fact be immune to, for example, alcoholic substances. Okay. The toxicating effect for, for soul comes from, uh, usually in all the readings, from some other place. For example, you know, from a spiritual connection to, for example, to a god. Like, for example, in the Christian theology, where, where the existence and the close proximity and close connection to god would be something that could intoxicate the soul in a holy way. But, okay. Yeah, but, but booze and wine, yeah, that, that is reserved for your mortal coil. Okay, try this on for a size. You go biking. You have a dog. The dog suddenly stops. You fly from the bike to the asphalt in front of you. Head first. You suffer a massive brain trauma. You are in a hospital in a coma for two weeks. You wake up and you now have 20% of the brain capacity that you had before the accident. So you are basically handicapped. And what happens to your soul now? Is it still intact? Mm. It's the same, Henrik? Yep. In in most readings, yep. The soul would still, in fact, be intact. Because the soul is separate from the brain damage. You can be a complete goddamn brain jackass and still have a soul. Okay. Try this on for a size then. You have a massive accident at home. Some, let's say, a huge metallic spiky object falls on one half of your brain. It destroys almost completely one side of your brain. You used to be a very nice man. After this accident, you are a very aggressive man who wants to kill everybody who you come across. Are you still the same Henrik? Is the same soul still intact? I actually was going to propose you the same, or actually propose myself the exact same question, because this actually is, is one of the cases where the soul concept kind of gets more trickier. Yeah. I mean, obviously, at that point, you wouldn't be the same man. I, you, you could say, make that argument already in the previous example you gave. Like, if you suffer a massive brain trauma, and, for example, your behavior changes, well, then, um, I guess, an argument could be made that you are not the same Kari that, and, or I wouldn't be the same Henrik that my relatives used to know me. Because I, I am, in that sense, I am a different person. But uh, when it comes to this question of the soul, that is kind of a trickier water. Because the soul automatically is not 
usually counted to, you know, equal your, well, your brain chemistry and how your brain works. But w- with this later example where my behavior for would change noticeably for worse, where I would become extremely aggressive, there the question can be actually proposed since my no, my new actions, these aggressive actions which would still happen because of the outside influence, but I would still be doing those, and those could be be evil in the sense that that could be could be said that the evil acts I do because of the brain damage still kind of a tarnish my soul. That actually is quite an interesting philosophical and theological question. Like, to a what point is your soul affected by the actions you do if you do not practically choose to do them yourself? Or out of the free will that you have had yeah. previously? Because because in, in a way what you are doing is something that is evil and therefore it should have an effect to your soul but you, like you said, you are doing it because of an outside influence. Yeah, it's a big discussion point. Not sure how we got here <laughs> anymore. But Maybe it's... we should actually have a priest or someone like that in this podcast sometime, you know, and propose this question to him, because I can't actually give you a satisfactory answer to that question, because I myself haven't been able to actually answer the question myself. The way I I have understood and internalized it in the religious sense is that if you have a soul, it kind of is something that that would not get tarnished in the process because you are acting kind of against your own original, pure, real self. Yeah, and... But then, then the question arises, what is the real you and all these internal and external influences... Uh, it's basically making in theology the point that all of these influences are null and void. That, that soul is kind of a separate of all of that. Uh, yeah, that that in a way could be one way to take. And but then again, not I, because you are judged because you do something wrong, so your soul is corrupted at this point, yeah? In a way, yeah. So that's kind uh, of confusing. Also that. It is confusing. And to add another layer there, th- this is something where I have to once again confess that I am not an expert in theology, so I might get something wrong here. But in Christianity, there is the notion that heaven and hell don't necessarily have to be physical places or actual planes like there doesn't need to be a place hell and place heaven but heaven and hell can also be your proximity to god like heaven would be a close proximity to god that would be the situation for your soul where your soul is near god and hell by this take the hell would be your soul's absence from god and if you would take it so that, you know, uh, the soul can kind of uh, get nearer to God already as you live, and during that time, you know, you devote yourself to God, and you take God in your heart and as your savior, and this way your soul gets near to God. You know, after the accident, it could be work so that, you know, your soul would still remain in that close proximity to God because... Once you had the as much free will as you can possibly have, you made that devotion and you gave yourself to God and this way you kind of uh, earned the situation or place heaven and your actions now wouldn't anymore necessarily affect that one because you wouldn't still be free willingly gambling away your devotion to God. Well, do you have anything to input on, like, why the hell would the puppet master at this point want to reproduce, like, the biological mortals? This is the case that she, he makes, right? What's the point? Just to create a machine, no, machine what, copy? No, what, what, what puppet master is, is proposing is that he and Kusanaki would merge their identities. Yeah. Kind of, a, once again, merge their, their souls. 
or the ghosts. Yeah, what 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 what, what is this talk about reproducing? Uh, it's it's not physical reproducing. Okay. It's a reproducing in a sense that through the merging of their identities, both yeah. their identities and their capabilities, because that's yeah, what yeah. Puppet Master is bringing to the table. Yeah, yeah, of course. They, yeah, they, they would form a new kind of a sentient being. And the helicopters can't fire because th- that is actually quite funny. They cannot take contact anymore because of their stupid full window monitors. So they are completely blinded. But then there is a quote, your effort of being what you are limits you, end quote, like a sales speech for emerging. Yeah, in that the puppet master takes the notion that, for example, Stuart Hall has made about human identity, where Hall has made the case that human identity is an ever-changing process. Like there, there is never such a yeah. there is never such th- thing as Henrik or Curry in a way that that would be you know eternal because w- what is Henrik will change by the times and by the actions and what happens to me and what I do and how I react like the yeah. identity changes that way and I- in that point Kusanaki is kind of a hesitant towards the merge because. She wants to keep hold of her identity, or her ghost, or soul, however you want to say it, but Gusanaki doesn't at first want to take that step, you know, to merge their consciousnesses, because she feels that that would be the loss of her identity, and she does not want to do that. And the Puppet Master is driving point the Stuart Hall perspective that, the identity is meant to change, and it will change. So there is no identity in the sense that it would stay stagnant forever. And yeah. because of this, you should actually, you know, obsessively protect it. Yeah, perhaps could be said that one interesting theme here is that this film makes no argument about the morality of anything that happens here. It doesn't say that it's fine that this AI or now sentient being entity puppet master, which is uh, all kinds of a terrorist criminal, now merges with another one to make something great. Kind of the ending goes in the way to say that it's kind of A-OK because Bato is there to support this new new entity. But uh, yeah... Like on the wider societal sense, I don't think there's any comment on that. Uh, not on this film side. This is one of the points that actually drive me absolutely fucking crazy in the live action remake. Oh. And, and seeing, hearkening back to our previous discussions about is me and is identity and the soul um, is human special. I guess this would also drive you nuts in the live action remake because the live action remake takes exactly the opposite turn oh dear on this question instead of kind of us not giving you a clear answer and being a bit like it's a-okay at least on pato's side like in anime in the live action kusanaki refuses the merge at the end of the film precisely because she feels that her Identity or ghost or soul, whatever you want to call it, is so special because she is so special that she will not sacrifice that specialness by merging with the, well, that okay. film's puppet master. Isn't that kind of boring? There's nothing to chew on philosophically when you leave the theater. It is, it is. And I felt that that was very much betraying the source material. Most notably also because... Another thing that the live action remake does is that it presents the science as an evil thing, like so many goddamn American sci-fi films does. The Hunger Robotics, which is the robotics film of the live action remake, they are the kind of the ultimate bad guys in the end, whose evil knows no bounds. There is the constant messaging that you and me, we are so extremely special 
and so extremely valuable and that we are more than our memories. For example, which is one of the key messages of the film and through all this, you know, the fetishizing of the self and the fetishizing of the identity and the specialness of Kusanaki in a live action remake, the film actually ends up saying that technology and science is bad. And that that is something that the anime never does actually do. It showcases you different sides of technology and it showcases you dangers that can hide in the technology in a way that, you know, it can be used wrongly. But the anime Ghost in the Shell never goes and says to you that technology is evil. Kind of then all over the place. Well, the Puppet Master has a large network from which to draw different kind of sources from of information and somehow the puppet master really wants to merge with a cyborg with an inferior understanding to his but hey you know the more you know and this is i guess to just commit some kind of a cyborg version of a zombie movie killing kusanagi in the process in a sense yeah in a sense and in a sense giving birth to something new yeah freaky well, yeah, my take on the ending is that neither one of them actually ceases to exist. Like, in yeah. the end, when there is the new body where Pacho has transferred the consciousness, there still exists the Kusanagi and there also exists the Puppet Master. And now they just are one consciousness, sharing a body in some kind of a unison. Yeah without going crazy and having multiple personalities. Somehow they coexist. Then some feathers, an angel, and they finally shoot, and Bato loses his hand. Puppet Master has already transferred himself to Kusanagi, so destroying the body of what was Puppet Master is all for nothing. And cut to Bato's house. Creepy two-way image of the cyborg. This is the freakiest part of the film. You first see the mirror image, you got to the not mirror image, and actually there are elements in, in that character and in that setting that changes when we switch the view. I mean, not just that it's a not mirror image, but yeah, you take a closer look at the image and there's different things going on. And talk of the political re reverberations of the whole incident from Bato. The fusion cyborg now wants to leave Bato's apartment. Fancy apartment, by the way. Kind of like a, some rich tennis player's apartment. Uh, yes, somehow... th there you see that you should uh, definitely work for a governmental <laughs> black ops unit. <laughs> somehow this new cyborg says that even though the puppet master was way more smarter, this new entity is not puppet master, nor Kusanagi, as we have discussed. And the final quote is, well... Where shall I go? The net is vast and infinite. And goodbye. Roll credits. We did it! Come, come on, the, this hasn't been even the longest recording we have done in this podcast. <laughs> I think that's Halloween 6. That or the apocalypse now. I mean, b both that, were goddamn tricks to get through. That's for sure. Wow, that was uh, Ghost in the Shell, and since we are indeed making some kind of record breaking here soon enough, let's just go on and let's see. Okay, guess we should go with Premiere and Box Office. Budget 10 million USD, and opening weekend wasn't anything interesting in Europe, but cumulative worldwide gross is... Uh, almost six hundred thousand dollars so yeah this kind of tanked pretty badly at the box office at the time but then gained a lot of popularity later on and by the word of mouth and basically got its money back via uh, selling home videos and the, yeah, Go yeah ghost in the shell was one of the vhs era animes that like discussed previously along with Akira, was one of those films that helped to push anime into the West. And according to one source, it finally garnered uh, 43 million from box office and home video in total. Let's cut a bunch of crap here and go to different cuts of this film. 
The ending credits theme of the film's English version is One Minute Warning by Passengers by U2 and Brian Eno. Brian Eno. And there's a different song in the Japanese version. Let's go to the quickies. No objections? Uh, no objections. Uh, unless you want to talk about just soul a little bit more. <laughs> God damn it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so quickies. Uh, favorite performance? Uh, well, the, the, this is kind of a tricky <laughs> one. Since I myself am, am going with the English dub. Go with that. Uh, the first answer kind of a would be Mimi Woods as Major Kusanaki, but Mimi has gathered quite a lot of opposition from the fans of the film throughout the years, but maybe... From the English dub, Richard Epcar, who played Pato. You know, I actually heard the US and Japanese version as stated, but actually I quite liked the mechanical performance of Kusanagi in the States version, so I'm just gonna be evil to all you all you nerds out there, so Kusanagi, US version, Mimi. See, that, that's what you get when you don't have a soul, man. <laughs> Touche. Touche. And favorite scene? Uh, I'm divided. Uh, I'm divided. It's either, you know, during the 55 minute mark when the whole group is tracking the section 6 and there is that multiple cuts showcasing the different parts of the section 9 following leads. The same which you called the meditative scene in the film. Oh yeah, yeah. I I I kind of a I I have a soft spot in my heart for these scenes which doesn't in fact have that much happening in them action wise, but which showcases a team of people investigating and following clues simultaneously. I like those following clues and following lead scenes in movies. Wait, uh, uh, sorry, did you mean this meditative scene that is the first one or the uh, second one with the police cars? Uh, the, the the first one is with the plane flying overhead. I'll go with that. Uh, no, I, I mean the later yeah. one, the night time. It's excellent, I have to admit. But I'll just go with the day version. And favorite quote? That, and this is once again going with the English dub, so I, I don't know how this quote goes with the, you know, the original Japanese audio and English subtitles, but when the team is just before they start chasing the garbage back guys, Kusanaki's notion, over-specialize and you breed in weakness, it's slow death. Okay, I will go with section 6 chief, quote, I don't understand anything anymore. <laughs> <laughs> well, I could also go with I like this life is like a nodal point born in an overwhelming sea of information. That is also a good one. I, I was actually, you know, counting on you taking Pato's quote, how memories are nothing more than information. Oh, okay. Like, like I, I was banking my money that that was your, your choice. I kind of st stuck with this humorous line, or ones that kind of don't make any even sense, like, but those, shoot two trackers next time. <laughs> yeah, favorite kill. To disappoint everyone listening to this, I'm, I'm gonna go with quite a lackluster kill. It is during the end of the film when they are chasing the dummy car, and the sniper kills the driver of the car. That sniper killed. Henchman is my pick. Oh, when Bato is doing the Rambo thing around the cars. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. That's kind of the scene that I had in mind, but could just go with... I don't know, like... If There's you can not call that it. many kills in this film. Yeah. The most easy choice would be the kill of the diplomat in the beginning, but I'm still gonna say that they kind of killed uh, Kusanagi and uh, rebirthed something else. So let's just go with that, because it's the most memorable sort of a end of character. Random confusion question time. Oh, would you like is, to... Is there a soul, Kari? <laughs> um, 
Yes, but it's not probably what you see it as being. Well, well, now I'm intrigued. It's just, it's just a funny name that the humans have given to a part of our functions. Like what makes us more special than most animals, at least. Okay. So with that out of the way, what is the first image that comes to mind? <laughs> it's uh, K- Kusanagi and Puppet Master connecting at the end. Okay. My pick would be... And this is kind of a cheap shot because the image has been used absolutely everywhere. But that moment when Kusanaki breaks her body and her arms kind of comes flying off. And there is that side shot of her as her torso kind of twists as she oh, tries yeah. to break into the spider tank. That is some cinematic moment right there. That That is and that is also the image that has basically been in everywhere when Ghost in the Shell has been discussed. Which image best exemplifies Ghost in the Shell for Henrik? I really don't know, actually. I guess it would be that same scene. I guess it's that. It's that scene. Hard to pick one, but I will go with the overhead flying plane. There was one analysis that saw the plane flying overhead as kind of a Kusanagi, that this machine is kind of flying in the sky, free as a bird, but it's something that Kusanagi kind of cannot do in a ghost sense, or something like that. And th- this smells once again like <laughs> weird YouTube videos. <laughs> Just like the connection that he tried to make with the Bible and one line in this film, which was actually... W- uh, and this connection does not exist at all if you look at the Japanese original dub. So okay, what 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 is the connection? The connection was in the US version. There's this line: "What we see now is like a dim image in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face." Well, this face to face part—that's now me talking. This face to face part was not in the Japanese version, going by the subtitles. But this guy connected this with the as a reference to the Corinthians 13.12. Quote, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. End quote. I, I can kind of see the bridge of logic there. Yeah, maybe, but um, let me see. Yeah, maybe. Uh, I think the strongest part there is just face to face. Yeah, the, the, yeah, that that is the strongest part. Like it mostly comes down to that you can find a similar sentence both in the you know the English dub, I guess, was the one that the guy was going on here. I haven't seen myself this video, so I I don't know what he referenced back to. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm guessing he was talking about the English dub. So then the English dub and the Corinthians and kind of a similar sentence and build the connection from there. What took you out of Gits? Actually nothing. Especially on, on these later viewings. I remember that during my first time seeing this, I was somewhat taken out from the film by the complexity of the plot and kind of a how much effort you had to put in to follow the plot. I didn't completely manage to do that during the first time, but now that I'm more versatile in following the movie, I actually stay with it throughout the running time. Yeah, honestly, I don't think, as mentioned, the plotline is not that complicated, but it's made out as extremely complicated, especially because we bounce back and forth with themes and names and organizations and uh, who is evil and who is not is kind of not so clear in this film. Yeah, it is in its core, it's quite simple spy crime thriller film, but unlike many, for example, American counterparts, this does not hold your hand and Mm. give you the moment where once again someone spits out the exposition that and retell something that has already happened in the film. Yeah, so imagine your general Japanese film, but on steroids, and with 450-page manga somehow. 
perplexingly punched into this one hour, 22 minutes film. What took me out? Well, definitely on the first go, what took me out was the unnecessary complexity of the plot. It's not unnecessary, goddammit, man. I would say it is, but most definitely it will open up to you after further viewings. Might take a couple of tries, especially if you're not going to read kind of a additional literature. What the hell is going on? But you yeah, just yeah. I, I have to pay attention what is going on throughout the film. Good lord, yeah. Good luck with that, with all those names and different connections, and then something not being very important, like what was this bounty hunter type of arms dealer guy with hundred thousand dollar suggested payoff for delivering those. It explains the character motivations and actions in that scene, goddammit, man. <sighs> eh, okay, what pulled you in? Um, the mood and the atmosphere, which actually starts right off the bat from the first scene. But most definitely the overlying mood and the feeling you get from this film. I would say that is the strongest clue that keeps you in this film. Yeah, unlike for you, what definitely did not pull me in, well, okay, to an extent, but it really wasn't like the core thing that pulled me in here, the philosophical points. Because I felt that I've seen this like a million times before in a different package and, you know, just, we have talked about it. I think there's too much clear like open pondering of these things and they feel a little bit unnatural in those particular situations where they take place that's just my take my take but what pulled me in visuals for sure detail in the animation the score is quite great if you listen to the soundtrack actually the this one song where you have the drums i believe it's during the opening titles the drumming goes on for probably 60 minutes or something. Very long. Strongest act. One, two, three. What would you say? Mm, maybe the third one. It like it, it, it's hard to say, but but the third act maybe still has most of the philosophical pondering and it does have... Well, I, I, I also can't vouch for this. Does it have more violence and action than the previous parts? Definitely it does not have any more kills than the previous acts, but... Maybe the third act is a bit more action-packed, and the philosophical questions maybe reach their point in the third act. Yeah, just randomly came to my mind that actually the starting of the film with Kusanagi falling from the window, right? That's very much something that you would see in the Matrix when Trinity falls out of the window and gets shot. Well, yeah, strongest act. Maybe I'll go with the beginning because I like the pre credit sequence. Why? Because of the falling out scene. The most exciting moment. I guess the tank battle. Yeah, most definitely. Scissors of Sacrilege. What would you change in the film, Henrik? I actually wouldn't change anything. Would you not it, 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 simplify it, the storytelling? No, if you can't keep up with the storytelling, try again until you get good at following movies. Once again. Like, like if, if you want simplistic storytelling, you know, in Ghost in the Shell film, go watch the American live action remake. You deserve it. I would say that this movie unnecessarily makes some things overly convoluted and brings up some points that are not very needed. For the most part, they are actually needed. You would not believe it, but as condensed as this is, for the most part, the information that you have, I would say, is is valuable. But, for example, I mean, it, it could kind of like streamline some things. <laughs> I think because you have these two trash truck drivers. Like I said, the other guy gets beaten up. And then he is forgotten, and we get the other truck driver for the next scene. I mean, you could have just gone with the one fucking truck driver throughout and concentrate on this character. Things like that. Or calling names from the pre credit sequence at the very end of the film that was just mentioned for five seconds and that's it. Kind of like a throwaway but, line. Yeah, well, the truck driver scene was 
there to showcase you exactly how bad yeah. effect the hacking can have and to kind of give you once again one question concerning the identity and memories like are they something or are they just information yeah. and the later scene where they once again drop the name of the scientist or the engineer it, it kind of a ties the thing back together giving you a meaning to what happened at the beginning of the film yeah no arguments this time and you really know Henrik you're watching Ghost in the Shell when you hear the opening choir at the opening credits I would say the same it's kind of a schizophrenic soundtrack or maybe that's not a good word it's um I, I I wouldn't say it's schizophrenic. Like actually it's once again those moments where exactly how packed the movie is kind of shines through because from what I've gathered the song that plays it is some kind of a wedding hymn. Therefore there you can also pick up the symbolism of wedding between the cybernetic body and the ghost. Hmm. Wedding was not exactly in my mind, but it's haunting and it's a disturbing choir. That it is also. Henrik, three adjectives to describe Ghost in the Shell. Well, I, I picked these, you know, just for you. Terminator understands feelings. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't work. <laughs> no, 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 it, it doesn't. It doesn't. I'm, I'm just messing with you. <laughs> Uh, my ad- uh, adjective is would be deep, dark, and delicate. Hmm. Pseudo philosophical, uh, haunting, and uh, convoluted. Did you watch your watch, Mr. No. Henrik? Watching Not the film at once. No time for that. Me neither. That out of the way. Henrik, would you recommend Ghost in the Shell? I most definitely would. It's not too often that you actually get a film that dares to propose philosophical questions to its audiences. And most definitely on this level that Ghost in the Shell does. And on top of that, it is a landmark film that dare help to defy the cyberpunk as a film genre inside sci-fi. So in in that sense also, I I would say everyone should check out Ghost in the Shell. It's also a very good exercise in getting into, you know, more complicated and more hard to follow films that don't see the trouble of holding your hand throughout. No kidding, Henrik. I guess I'm just gonna go back to my hostel and it was a nice evening. Thank you, Henrik, and bye-bye. I, I I have a dreadful feeling what is going to happen next. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, about my picture album. We can. So okay, would I recommend this film? It's a kind of a tough <laughs> question, actually. No, it's not actually. Because <laughs> on the one hand, how the fuck do you recommend something like this that you definitely? It's not something that you would like recommend to somebody on the street hey have you seen this ghost in the shell maybe you could be good to watch with your girlfriend and watch this it will be amazing entertainment for you tonight you most <sighs> definitely would you know if it if it's too hard for the bugger then the bugger is actually a failure of human being <sighs> and think think about it from from this perspective you know if you would recommend this film to someone and he or she wouldn't get it because it it would be too hard and you know too heavy for him. Well, then you can go and tell him how he's not special and there is nothing wondrous about him, and he's just you know a combination of easily replicatable processes. <laughs> You're so brutal. <laughs> well, okay, well. I most definitely would not recommend Ghost in the Shell, unless you have a cyborg brain. If you plan to have more devoted time for this film, yeah, okay, you might get something out of it. What you will most likely get out of it, as a cyborg model carry, is the beautiful visuals, interesting soundtrack, some interesting philosophical points, most of them kind of fall flat for me, because 
Yeah, like everything said previously. But okay, okay. I mean, it's great for your visual senses. So knock yourself out. Just don't say I didn't warn you. For most people, I would not recommend this. No, no, absolutely fucking not. Get but if, the fuck out. <laughs> like said, if if you love manga, you will probably love this. Knock yourself out. And punch your face into solid wall objects. Have fun with it. Remind me to, you know, ask the Jehovah's Witnesses to pay you a visit at some day. <laughs> what? What's the implication? That 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 fall flat. <laughs> Shit. But did I like this film? I moderately enjoyed it, but I think some other people will have more fun with the philosophical points. Well, did you enjoy the fight which we had throughout this episode? Because it has been a long time since we last have actually been so against each other during these recordings. I most certainly did. And in the coming episodes we might as well pay more attention to the movies that we choose because there is absolutely a lot of golden material that we could punch ourselves in the face digitally here over and over. But there are some of those coming up. Nightmare on Elm Street 2 seems to be one. Mission Impossible 2 seems to be one. It, it, it appears to me that you are a man of culture. L- like you. you look down upon an, an extremely philosophical film that asks deep questions and which you disregard outright because they go against your worldview and then you come in and hail Nightmare on Elm Street 2 and Mission Impossible 2. These, dear listeners, these are the people who do not like Ghost in the Shell. But yeah, you know, it, 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 this actually was surprisingly, you know, hit butting episode for a change. Yeah, I had some good time sparring. And we will get to do that very soon, once again. Most definitely. Most definitely in many episodes, if we come across some kind of philosophical points. Dear listeners, this has been the Flea Club once again, with great effort to your ear fiesta. Thank you for joining us. You can find us on the deepest levels of hells incorporated. YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, what have you, Twitter. What's our next film? <laughs> I actually don't know. Please tell me. It's a uh, a screaming man from the country called Chad in Africa. I hope it's not just <laughs> you know hour and half of some guy screaming on a camera. <laughs> no, well, we haven't very much touched on pure art films. We could do that as well. Watch some guy just y- screaming y- his you know, head off for half an hour. Just, just say the word. I have just this stuff. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but yeah, to our dear listeners, even though it may have appeared like that in, during this episode, me and Kari still don't, at least officially, hate each other deeply. No, no, nothing like no. that. Yeah, I still do respect Kari's word views, even though I do not fully accept them. <laughs> or, you know, share them. I don't fully share them. Yeah, I mean, like, but our history kind of started with this headbutting. We were kind of arguing about opinions. Yeah, that, that, that's that's how the beautiful friendships are built. <laughs> but yeah, you know, from my end, all our listeners are special and beautiful people, human beings, and Karis and Atari Chakuar. I will, I will just say I will just say this. <laughs> uh, 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 I will just say this, Henrik. I, I, uh, you, you can't, uh, you know, deny that that isn't, you know, giving credit to your simplistic processes that can be easily recorded. <laughs> I will, I will just say this. I, in a one sense, I respect the philosophical <laughs> points laid out in Ghost in the Shell, but on the other hand. I feel frustrated by them because I have reached a deeper level of consciousness. And I'm looking for the harder stuff than Ghost in the Shell. Not egomaniacal at all. Yeah, I I can give you that one. (laughs) Yeah, okay. See you again next week, dear listeners. Yeah, we try not to fight this much in the next episode.
human bodies in her head. Uh, human parts in her head. Theology. 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 Consen- uh, consensus. The budget for this film was 10 USD. Uh, 10 million USD. 